Great, we're just waiting a minute while everyone files in. Welcome. Great, I think we're gonna get started. It looks like we're holding steady. So welcome everyone. So glad to see you so early on in the semester. I'm Meredith Fluke, I'm the director of the Iris and B. Gerald Cantor Art Gallery at the College of the Holy Cross. And I'm joined here today by James Weilu, who's the director emeritus of the Worcester Art Museum. I'm in a lecture in the visual arts department at Holy Cross, where he teaches museum studies and 17th century Dutch art. Uh, today's program is held in conjunction with uh, Mirror of the World, Two Centuries of Collecting at Holy Cross, which is now on view at the Cantor Gallery through February 20th. So just a quick note on format today. Um, I'm going to present for a solid half hour, uh, sort of the concept of the show and its origins. You are welcome at any time to put questions into the Q&A function. Uh, the chat's been disabled, so please use the Q&A. Uh, I'm not sure that we'll get to questions uh, with, in the first half hour or so, but we're going to turn to them um, in the second half of the program. Uh, and we'll facilitate any questions that you have already put into the chat or into the Q&A or um, put in at that time. And they can be for either myself or for Jim Weilu. So this exhibition, Mirror of the World, comprises 46 works of art that are held in collections across the Holy Cross campus. It represents two years of work by the staff of the Cantor, uh, enabled by the programming space created during a pandemic and completed in part to prepare the Cantor for its move into the new prior performing arts center in that it reflects the work that we've done, so not exhaustively. Uh, the exhibition endeavors to outline the history of the art collections housed on campus and to highlight some of the strengths and challenges that characterize them. So the exhibition is meant to inter interrogate the purpose and value of the college art collection, and especially the Holy Cross <laughs> art collection. I'm going to ask my participants who are um, joining me, I think, um, Luigi, Paul, if you could mute, make sure you're muted. Um, so interrogate the purpose and value of the art collection, um, provide a benchmark for the work that we have done so far and that needs to be done in order to maintain high standards of collecting and also collections care and help us prepare for future opportunities, whether those opportunities be exhibitions, um, integration into the academic program or collection building. Um, so I've invited James Weilu here to, um, to interrogate and to have him interrogate me. Um, and I just wanted to start by uh, asking him a, a question that will help us understand sort of his point of view. Um, so Jim, my question is this, um, can you explain to us what it means to be an encyclopedic collection? Um, and I know that you, we all know that you were the director at the Worcester Art Museum. So what does the work of a director of the Worcester Art Museum mean in terms of collections work? Okay, well, thanks Mara, for this opportunity. Yes, um, well, the Worcester Art Museum, very fortunate that it can really call itself an encyclopedic collection. And what does that mean? Well, first of all, it, it, we're trying to represent the world's art, you know, and in general, museums, uh, I would say, particularly encyclopedic collections, trying to show, carry forth civilization. So you're trying to get representative examples from the various cultures around the world. Now, obviously, um, Every country and every city and every museum has its biases. Uh, and uh, the museums that were 
I should say Worcester was really fortunate to get started at the end of the 19th century. And I say that for many reasons. One, Worcester was a booming industrial city with a lot of money to be able to buy art when one could get it. You know, American museum, Americans never thought we could have the museums that they had in Europe by that point, which were basically, you know, church um, uh, uh, royal collections that were open to the public, like the Louvre, et cetera, and the Uffizi. Um, whereas American museums, and they were always founded for educating the public, promoting art and art education, that's in almost all of the early mission statements of these museums. And so it was to get representative examples. Now, I say we were fortunate to, and the museum was founded in 1896 and opened two years later, sort of in the nick of time to be able to get some collections that you just couldn't get even 50 years later. I mean, we were involved in an excavation with the Louvre and two other American museums. But even from the get-go, the Worcester Art Museum started collecting really ancient art. I'm talking about Greek and Roman. Uh, and, and contemporary art. I mean, we were a major site for contemporary art. Uh, and um, along with, for example, the Carnegie uh, in, in, in Pittsburgh. Um, and we were, we were buying those uh, Homers and Sargents when they were alive, <laughs> the artists were alive. Um, and even that, you know, is really hard today. Look at, we were the first museum in the world to buy uh, Monet's water lilies in 1910, and the first museum in the world to buy a painting by Gauguin, you just, it's almost impossible for museums to uh, compete now with, with those prices. So, um, but I, I say that because Worcester was really fortunate to think about an encyclopedic collection from the very beginning. Now, I will be the first to say that like any museum, it had its biases. First of all, we're a Western museum, very influenced by European uh, museums. And um, there are certain areas that we didn't collect in. Ironically, the founder of the Worcester Art Museum, Stephen Salisbury, was a pioneer in um, uh, supporting many of the archaeologists who were working in Central and South America. And um, he would have offered his collection to the Worcester Art Museum, but it didn't go there because um, they thought it was ethnographical material. Went to Harvard, where he graduated from. Uh, so every um, collection sort of starts somewhere. And I know we're going to talk about that with Holy Cross's collection. Um, and um, that's sort of where you begin. Happily, Worcester did think about, you know, all the civilization, even though we didn't in the beginning collect oceanic art or African art, that's fine art, et cetera. Um, but we fortunately were able to do so in more recent decades. In the 1930s, when Francis Henry Taylor came to direct the Art Museum, and he spent 10 years here at Worcester and then went on to direct the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York for 15 years and then came back and directed the second time. Uh, he really um, fleshed out the museum, shall I say. He, he talked a lot about 50 centuries of art, from Egyptian to contemporary, Western and Eastern. But even from the, the beginning, Worcester was collecting uh, very good examples of Asian art. Uh, there were a lot of people interested. And again, it, it depends a lot on your local collectors. Um, they were interested in the uh, Asian world and traveling there, et cetera. So that maybe is a long-winded question to an encyclopedic uh, answer to your question, encyclopedic collection. But you do want to collect the best examples, you know, because when someone comes to a museum, they expect to see the very best. Just like when you go to the symphony, you expect to hear the very best. Um, and the same with whether it's a science museum or a history museum. And this is a challenge, you know. I'm sure you're going to ask me more questions about that. <laughs> I am going to ask you more questions about that. Thank you. This is, I think it's helpful to, um, to, to think, to, to frame the Holy Cross collection a bit around kind of how um, a fully formed collection comes together that we know we can sort of look back on that history and understand, um, you know, we, when you walk into the West Art Museum, you see a full-fledged collection that has has you know hundred years of of thought that's been put be, put into it, um, and the Holy Cross collections are uh, sort of on the opposite end of of the spectrum. Um, so you know, even though every collection is a is sort of a combination of intentional mission based collecting, there's a lot of episodic and accidental accumulation uh, that occurs there as well. And for us we're sort of in this place where we're trying to understand, you know, all of this accidental accumulation um, and how to 
um, forge it into an actual collection. So um, that's the goal of this um, exhibition. It's the story that I'm trying to tell with this Mirror of the World show. Um, and the reason that you know I've called it Mirror of the World is because it really reflects Holy Cross as a Jesuit, a Catholic, a, you know, liberal arts um, college and its interactions with the world. So, all right, here's this, here, here's the exhibition. Um, the concept began when I first, um, when I first got to Holy Cross in the fall of 2019. Um, I came from a background of working with uh, collecting institutions where teaching and exhibitions um, were, also, were almost always drawn from institutional holdings. Um, and as you know, many of you know, the Cantor is scheduled to move into the new Prior Performing Arts Center, um, where uh, we will have a, a sort of a new, innovative, <laughs> proper storage space um, for collections, um, and also a seminar study room for art study. Um, so we needed to figure out um, what so many of the works are that are sort of on campus before we figure out best how to move them, how to store them, how to activate them, and hopefully use them in the future. Um, based on my initial survey of uh, art collections across campus, it became clear to me that some work um, needed to be done before we could really use the collection in any sort of consistent way. Um, so we have some works that are well documented, and especially the ones that have been um, given or purchased in the past um, sort of couple of decades. Um, but there are also a lot of historic collections that need to be physically and intellectually managed. Um, so Holy Cross collections are uh, a combination of this sort of intentional and accumulative. Um, my dig into the canter and then Holy Cross collections yielded a lot of information um, I learned that there you know, probably not surprisingly several collections that hold art on campus. And I'm just gonna discuss them quickly here um, in order sort of most formalized to the least formalized collections. So the first is one that um, many of you are probably familiar with is a proper Cantor art collection. Um, these are items that have been given um, a collection accession number. Um, and have a corresponding object file that goes with it um, in which we collect information about the object's history, its creator, its creation, provenance, um, and what has happened to it while it's been here on campus. Um, the Cantor Gallery was uh, founded in 1983 uh, as a temporary exhibition program, but it came with some gifts of Rodin sculptures and a few other sculptures like the um, Platzota sculpture, the big hand of Christ that's at, um, in front of Dinan. So um, there was a sort of small collection that came with the gift um, of the program's budget for the Cantor um, Art Gallery. Um, these all have been documented. We know where they came from. We know what they are. Um, a lot of them you see uh, in various exhibitions, and then sometimes you see them around campus. Um, here's a couple of examples of works of art uh, that are in our collection, um, the fantastic collection of uh, Southeast Asian textiles uh, that Susan Rogers has helped bring to uh, the college, uh, works of art that you see on display, um, like this one uh, made by Jim Stroud, who's an alumnus of 1980. Um, that's his work, and that's him and his, his uh, wife, Janine Wong, standing next to it. Um, he is also uh, an alum who printed the um, image of, um, of Martin Luther King Jr. that you see, John Wilson's um, print on the wall that's in, up in the gallery right now. Um, these are all items that have been sort of formally put into the Cantor collection and um, we know what they are. We use them frequently. Um, we, uh, we teach from them. We display them in various exhibitions. Um, these are some examples of new acquisitions. So uh, you'll see these when you come to the gallery. These are two gifts that were given by an alum named Robert Cox, Japanese wood block prints um, that are, are new to the Cantor collection. So I hope that you have a chance to come see them in the gallery. Um, the second sort of major group I would want to talk about are archives collections. Um, so um, most of the art in archives is an assortment of items that were originally given to the college. Um, directly, they're often installed right onto the walls um, or you know, right into a physical place on campus. 
Um, often when those spaces get reshuffled, um, for example, the library gets renovated, um, those items get stored in archives and they kind of end up there for um, long periods of time. Um, some of these items were given directly to college archives, um, predating the foundation of the Cantor in 1983. Um, here on the wall, you see some of the works from the Fatherless Children of France portfolio that was um, gathered together um, in World War I as a benefit for um, the orphans or children who were orphaned because um, of the war. Um, we have 12 of them on the wall, but there are many more. They are housed in archives and they were gifted to the archives in the 1950s. Um, you see some enamels uh, that sort of ended up in archives, a, a, a part of the accumulation of, of artworks there. Um, other items in archives um, maybe weren't classified as artworks originally, and I, and I thought that was interesting, Jim, that you brought up, um, you know, things that might have been considered ethnographic materials, there are materials in archives that, um, you know, maybe wouldn't, you wouldn't have thought of them as art 100 years ago, but um, as the world changes, we might think of them differently. Um, the fantastic collection of um, Jesuit books um, and, you know, very some of them being very old and, and very valuable Jesuit books. Um, we have a, a Jesuit portrait that you see here um, that I can talk a little bit about, talk a little bit more about later. Um, these are things that um, have sort of ended up in archives and have you know, part of that accumulation process. Um, there have been attempts to catalog all of the artworks in archives and some met to some success and then sometimes not as much success because we just don't have um, a lot of information about all of the pieces that have ended up there. A lot of times what one would work with is the things that are attached directly to the artwork. So they don't have documentation, they don't have an object file. Um, and here you see an example of one of those um, paintings that has um, an artist name attached as a plaque to the front of it. Um, and that's sort of the, some of the limitations that we see with works of art um, that have ended up in archives. The Cantor is also a collecting, it also collects a lot of things that come out of people's offices or just um, accumulate there. Here's some examples um, of works of art that have accumulated in Cantor storage. Um, we call them found in collection items. They have not been formally accessioned into our collection. Um, we cannot do that until we know exactly what they are um, and hopefully where they came from and how they got um, into the Cantor storage space. Um, here is a great example of a group of objects that were given, we think, after much digging <laughs> um, in the past couple of years by an alum named Frank Gallagher. Gallagher. Um, I, I highlight these um, Asian export items that you see on the left because Jin Zimi, our intern, or Hankins intern, is actually doing research on these items and is presenting them in an exhibition that will be installed um, in the resource gallery outside of the Cantor Gallery um, this semester. So you'll see these again um, with lots of research and attention attached to them. Um, and I, on the on the right, I just put a picture of of some of the storage um, issues that you might <laughs> imagine with um, pieces that have been kind of taken out of places and put into basements. Um, and this is one example of a of a storage space that we um, we sort of have taken over as the Cantor, but none of these items are officially Cantor accessioned items. Um, so we're getting less and less structured <laughs> in our collecting in our collections. Um, and then the last uh, group, I would say general college art collections, um, like the groups of paintings that you see on display in Dinant. Um, these are works that we that we you know know a little bit about, sometimes we know about. Um, we have a number of these, the Jesuit portraits on the on the wall. And, um, uh, and so these are works that we know something about. Sometimes they're still out. They haven't, um, they haven't been put into storage spaces yet. Um, we have one of them that we brought into the gallery to kind of represent that group of objects. Um, and you see it there. Um, on the right, it's a adoration of the shepherds. And um, these are the works of art that need a lot of thought and care um, and research so that we can understand them better so we can figure out how to take care of them and um, and how to how to manage them in the future. Um, so the exhibition was really meant to sort of bring together pieces from all over campus to highlight all of these different collections that we have um, and then to um, help us make these steps towards a plan um, so that we can start thinking about these collections as um, 
useful items, things that we can teach with, um, things that we can put on display, um, things that we can take care of um, as we move toward the future. Um, so Jim, if you have any thoughts on this painting, <laughs> you can let me know. Um, it has no information except what you see here um, and a name on the back uh, of, I think probably the owner of the painting. I have a little more, I have some ideas. I'll skip over them for now. <laughs> um, so a walkthrough um, of the exhibition um, this really is organized in order to um, highlight these themes of historic collecting, um, of growth and teaching, of stewardship, um, and point to some issues around future growth. When you enter into the space, the first section that you encounter um, is a discussion about the connection between historic collections and the Jesuit mission. Um, so many of the works of art that came to Holy Cross in the first century or so of its existence were religious in nature. Um, each object in this collection, in this section is meant to point to larger groups that are out there um, around campus, um, including the historic books from the Jesuitana collection over in Archives and Distinctive Collections, um, many portraits of Jesuits. Um, I put this one here as a representative of all of the portraits of Jesuits that we have on campus. Um, it's a portrait of James Fitton, and um, it's, it's painted by an African-American um, painter named Nelson Primus in the, in the late 19th century. So it's sort of a little more, it's an intriguing painting um, and has a great history to it. Um, we also have these chalices that you can see in the picture on the left that were given to the college for use um, in the mass um, by alumni and groups of alumni. So um, there's a lot here to, to unpack around um, religious uh, works of art and um, where all of these works of art have landed across campus. The sex second section is really um, a discussion of growth of collections through connection to teaching and exhibitions. Um, of course, it includes works from the most developed Cantor collection, which is the Southeast Asian textiles um, that have been acquired through the stewardship um, of Emerita faculty, Susan Rogers. Uh, I also included uh, a work by John Paul Reardon, who is one of the founders of the art department at Holy Cross, and we have a large selection of his works um, in the Cantor collection, uh, and um, we were happy to put one out on view. The third section is really um, works that have been quote unquote discovered in storage, um, in which we have conserved uh, in order to learn more about them. This will be uh, part of a discussion that we'll have on February 9th um, with the conservators who worked on painting on the paintings and also frames, uh, Teresa Carmichael and Sue Jackson. Um, this section really discusses the role that institutions must play as stewards of art collections um, and really what our ethical duties are to understand, care for, um, and really try our hardest to plan for the use of item, items in our care. So uh, it has a larger, you can see as you're sort of looking through these that you can see there are sort of larger chats um, about these various ideas. Um, one of the things that I really wanted to bring up with the stewardship was um, what are the standards, the core standards for collections stewardship um, as per the American Alliance of Museums. So you can go in and, and read these and think about how the exhibition really relates to these standards, um, the idea of, of um, sort of making sure that you um, are collecting within your mission, um, that you're managing your documents, um, that you that you have and and your objects in your collection, um, that you're doing research, which is a really big piece of what this exhibition is about, um, that you're strategically planning for use and development of the collections, um, and that you're providing public access to collections. Um, so this has really been the guiding light uh, that has was sort of the beginning of this exhibition. And I should say that a lot of this work was enabled by a grant from the American Alliance of Museums and the IMLS, um, which was a self-study on collection stewardship that gave us some space and structure um, and a peer reviewer to really look across our collections and try to um, sort of mark the point that we're at and um, figure out what we need to do to make steps towards best practices for um, proper collections stewardship. 
And finally, the last section um, is works from the Cantor collection that have been most recently acquired. Um, so a collection for the future. They're meant to address um, the question of what, what do we want a Holy Cross collection to be? Uh, the works in the group really um, signaled certain strengths uh, of the collection, such as photography. Um, and that's a medium that's been collected at Holy Cross and the Cantor since the early 1980s. Um, and really to encourage discussions um, around sort of future acquisitions, sort of directions for future acquisitions to the Cantor collection, including artworks, um, maybe themes that we would be interested in exploring as an institution relevant to the mission, um, themes of social justice, of environmental issues, um, representation of marginalized populations. Um, these, these, you know, hopefully um, these are kind of directions that we might wanna think about for the Holy Cross collection um, as we're thinking about its relevance to the mission of the college. So that's the exhibition in a nutshell. Um, and of course there's more to it. So I encourage you all to come and uh, see the exhibition. Um, it closes on February 20th. Um, I hope that this is, I hope that this is bringing up some questions for you. Um, just put the mission statement up of the canter. Um, so please feel free to ask any questions that you, that you have. Um, Jim, I don't know if you have any questions for me right away. I have a couple for you to think about um, yeah i yeah lots of questions um but thank you for that overview um it's, it's always hard i mean there's so much to collect out there and i always think about when i was a young curator at the Worcester art museum and someone would come in and give this their work of art and i thought oh that's really great you know and when you walk to the Worcester art museum or most museums like the Worcester art museum maybe i would say a third to a, more than a half of the works in those galleries were donated by people from their own collections. And the rest were purchased by money that they gave to the museum. We don't get any money from the city. We never have. It's a privately funded museum. We get uh, state and federal grants competitively. But the point is that a museum does grow a lot um, by what people collect. And I mean, look at the Cantor Gallery has great road bands because of the Cantor family. And that will always evolve. Um, I would probably be the, I would have to say it's probably unlikely that someone's going to be developing a major collection of Egyptian art right now or you know these areas, some areas it's just too late unfortunately uh, to start out but we have so many great museums in America we should be very happy about that. Um, so I think it's something for Holy Cross thing about what are their treasures now as a building block it's a moving target and I know you and I've talked a bit about this Meredith because you start somewhere but it can change you could you know, maybe it's someone who's studying at Holy Cross right now is going to build a great collection. <laughs> One of my students got in touch with me recently who was in my museum studies class. He said, I'm making some money now. I want to start collecting. <laughs> Give me some advice. But I'm just saying, and, you know, who's to say what that art, because if you're collecting contemporary, you mm -hmm. know, they're going to probably make some mistakes like everyone does. And only time will tell what is the greatest. But there's certain areas where, you know, it's um, blue chips. Uh, you know, maybe say Renaissance or Baroque art or whatever. Um, so it's it's a moving thing, I, I think you want to say. But you certainly start with what you have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you know, uh, just to be clear about the 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 canter um, and and the college in general, there's no, there's never been, and and um, it, there isn't an acquisitions budget. So there's never been money for us to purchase um, and build a collection. Um, so all of the works that you see um, are, I mean, not all, and a the highest percentage, a high percentage of them are gifts um, to the collection and mostly by college alums. But then, you know, some of these, um, like the Robert Beecham uh, drawings and paintings are sort of at the, you know, have been shepherded in um, through faculty interest and through um, the connections that those faculty members have made. Um, to collectors who are out there in the world. So I, I, that's sort of the, how that, epi, you know, when you have these sort of episodic collections, it's because you've had one person um, who's sort of, you know, putting their eyes towards something um, for their own teaching and um, uh, 
which is, you know, which makes a lot of sense. So, you know, we sort of bring in these, these sort of, you know, groups of, of works uh, together. Um, and so you get these deep pockets in certain areas. Um, so one of the questions is, you know, and you, and you mentioned this with the former director at WAM, like, how do you think about smoothing the edges? Or do you think about, you know, if I'm going to be building a collection that crosses over disciplinary boundaries that people, you know, can use in different departments, um, you know, how do I start kind of, you know, building a collection that has, um, that's sort of more inclusive of different ways that people might um, want to interact with it is I, is one of the questions that I would ask. Or like the other option is to just go deep into these you know very specific things that you have um, and build you know the world's greatest collection of X uh, and then you know some of these other things that come along as well. Well, uh, <laughs> first of all, um, you know it is a liberal arts college, so and that's great because there's so many areas uh, and students in various can look at, and I love the interdisciplinary um, aspect of a museum that you can look at these works of art from many different perspectives. Um, one thing I wanted to say in the beginning too, is that um, taking works into the collection, it's a huge, huge decision. It's a huge decision. Right. That's something I, I didn't appreciate so much when I was a younger curator, because I thought, wow, they're giving us this great work of art. Well, you're gonna take care of that work of art for the rest of its life. That's a huge commitment. And you are, I don't wanna say you're doing a favor to them, but it's like, you know, you're the orphanage or whatever for that child that they will never be able to care of for the rest of their life. And it's huge, it's huge. You, you don't take these works in thinking you're gonna deaccession them as we call that, to let them go. That does happen from time to time. And I'm sure that Holy Cross will probably be doing some deaccessioning of things that you find that are, they were nice gifts, but they just aren't of the quality. And we have now a greater, better perspective than ever on it because it was hundred years ago or whatever that it was made or given. But I, I just think that the college, you're gonna find, and you already are finding some strengths within the, the holdings already. And I would say build on them for sure, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, you know, something that I wanted the exhibition to really highlight is, you know, really what your responsibilities to those objects are. Um, and, you know, the idea that you, you, you must, you are, you are ethically bound, you know, everything that's in your storage, you have to take care of those and you have to do it to the best of your ability, right? You can't decide, you know, to, to just let some things molder away. You know, once you have committed to it being an actual collection, um, you have to make that commitment to, to these works. So that's one of the transitions that I think is really important for us to keep our eyes on that we're working towards. And as we move into the new storage space, um, I think that move represents that commitment um, because what we're doing is we're putting things into, you know, a real storage facility meant for artworks. Uh, and, and so now we've, we've made, we've made the point. These are works of art that belong in an art storage space. And um, we have to work towards best practices in terms of caring for them. Um, and that obviously complicates some of the, um, some of the issues around you know what you can accept as gifts if things are in terrible condition and you you know somebody offers you something that you you know that you can't actually sort of take care of because it's um it's you know too far gone um you certainly have to think about you know how you how you can plan for and take care of all of these items i mean really and it's something i always highlight till the end of time <laughs> like until 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 it's all done um you have to be thinking about caring for these works of art um, so there's some, some questions that are coming up. Um, uh, Amanda Leister asks, what kind of contact can students have with objects in the collection? Are students ever allowed to touch art? Why or why not? Um, that's one of the things that I've been trying to, um, to really uh, work through with this um, sort of translation from um, groups of art, you know, art collections into a proper art collection. Um, and it goes with this idea of, you know, what are going to, what are best practices? Um, well, best practices is that we're not handling, we're not all handling works of art unless we've been trained to do so. Um, and so it means that some collect parts of the collection um, maybe don't get designated as the sort of accessioned objects and we keep um, certain study objects that can be handled by students. 
I mean, in terms of you know the proper Cantor collection, I don't know that handling will be part of it. Um, but really what we're trying to do is create opportunities for students to look at works of art um, in this new study seminar space that we'll have. Um, it's adjacent to art storage. And so um, the idea with it is that people will be able to pull um, items, you know, we would be able to pull items from storage for you and your students to look at um, while probably I'm, I'm handling <laughs> the work of art while wearing gloves. Um, so that's a really big goal of ours in moving into the new space is to have that kind of functionality to the collection. Um, and of course it goes hand in hand with a really big piece of this, which is kind of mundane, but very important, which is a new, um, a new database, um, which Paula Rosenblum and I have been um, working on uh, making, getting a database, first of all, and then um, figuring out how to, you know, have all of the works of art in our collection, and then some of these other collections maybe around campus represented in the database, which means we can keep information with the objects um, instead of it, you know, floating free. So, um, you know, some of these works of art that we have on view, I'm sure that there's information out there that hasn't stuck to the objects. And so we just don't, like, we just don't know things about them that other people might know. Um, the function of a database is to collect information around the objects, right, and, and keep those, those two things attached to each other. Um, it means that we would be able to track, you know, where things are on campus, and we have a lot of things that are on view in public spaces. Um, so this would be really helpful for that. Um, and most importantly, it would have a, a public facing it has, it does, we've already started this, right? it has a public face to it um, where um, you know, faculty or outside scholars can search up works of art in the collection uh, and say, okay, well, I know that you have, you know, these works of art that are relevant to this thing that I'm teaching, you know, can we make an appointment on Tuesday to come see these works of art as a class? And um, that's the kind of function that this collection should have. And it's part, it's sort of built into um, what that uh, AAM, um, standards for collection stewardship is in terms of making collections accessible. Meredith, I think will really be nice with a study room, let's call it whatever you want to call it, uh, works on paper, which can't be on view for a long period of time anyway, but they could be made much more accessible. And I think there's great, some great holdings. And some of those are in archives right now in different parts of the campus. So that would exactly. be really nice. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So um, we, you know, we're hoping that we can standardize how we store those works. Um, and then we can really easily pull them in and out of storage without doing any damage to them um, for people to you know, encounter with their classes. So photography, we have good holdings in, um, works on paper so that you can come, you would be able to, as a you know, professor to, to come with your class or to make an assignment for students to come you know, do a, a research project on, this, on a single work of art that we could pull out of storage for them. Um, Virginia Regan asks, are you planning on a permanent or semi-permanent display in the prior center outside of the gallery proper? We are, we are not um, at this point. We do not have any walls in the prior center. Uh, it's a lot of glass. Um, but we, when we get in there and live in there for a little bit, um, you know, maybe some spaces for display um, will become will make themselves apparent to us um, at this point. It's not entirely clear if that's a possibility, um, but we are still planning to keep works of art out um, on campus um, and to you know, keep rotating spaces like we have been um, you know, up in Smith, uh, in front of O'Kane, all of those spaces to keep them active. And you know, the more we can do of that, the better. Um, and all of this, of course, is enabled by having a tracking system um, and a database where we can actually say, okay, we, you know, with works on paper, this is something that concerns me, um, is that we don't have works, we don't want to have works on paper out for extended periods of time. You know, there, there's, there are real best practices for them where you have them on view and then rest them um, for longer periods of time. Um, this, you know, this tracking is really essential to that idea of, okay, that work of art we know was on view um, for three months, you know, four years ago. So now we can put it on view for three months, you know, again, um, versus that one was out for 12 years and we need it to, to take a break um, in a dark place for a while. Um, are there other questions out there? I see Caroline Quinn. Um, does Holy Cross's collection have any links to the Worcester Art Museum? Um, perhaps to fill the gaps. So this is an interesting question, Caroline, because um, you know the question of, and this was related to Professor Regan's question. You know, if you don't have things on permanent view, 
uh, and it, you know you don't have a, a permanent viewing space for the collection, um, you know what would be the function of filling in the gaps? Um, would you have works of art coming so that people can study them? Um, or do you just send people over to the Worcester Art Museum to see things there? Um, I think that's one of the reasons why I was interested in bringing uh, Professor Weilu here today is because, um, you know, how do you balance out what you might do at Holy Cross against what Worcester Art Museum already has to offer as, you know, an excellent collecting institution? Um, you know, what do we what do we need at Holy Cross that um, we need to have for for our students um, versus, you know, what you know, th that could that could be sort of value add um, for against the, the Worcester Art Museum's collections. Um, and that's an, that's a, that's a question that, you know, I think is important to, to be thinking about. Jim, I, think, I think every museum wants to have its niche, if you will. And yeah. um, and, you know, of course, with the Worcester Art Museum in the same community, we're still fortunate because obviously the students do use it a lot. It's great. Um, but there's strength at Holy Cross Gallery that we don't have. I think it's the Jesuitical one for particular. And you know what a, a great tradition and talk about you know involvement in the arts and internationally, it's it's just I and I don't you have a better handle on what's there already, but that's certainly an interesting area to think about building on, I think. That's just my opinion. Yeah, it's one of the reasons why I started this conservation project is because a lot of the works that we have. Um, that are you know rescu rescuable <laughs> that are um, in 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 storage spaces or you know over in archives that need a lot of care are things that are you know early gifts that are related um, you know perhaps to to a, a Jesuit history um, at the college um, so that's something why I kind of invent that's one of the reasons I sort of wanted to to look at some of these paintings um, you know also because they're they were in terrible condition and I felt as if they either we take care of them or we don't. And um, these paintings, if we, if we don't take care of them, they're, they're, they're not gonna come back from the dead. Um, so I started sort of with five paintings, um, all of them having kind of a, a, well, four out of the five having religious content to them. Um, early gifts to the college, uh, some of them having information that came with them and others not. Um, I'll just show you if you're interested. <laughs> Some, some of the, um, here's this uh, a, a painting that um, had, a, had a label on it that said, uh, painting of a bare-breasted woman, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, which I left the, that label on the painting because I, I find it so, um, so funny. <laughs> um, and so this is a painting that was in a basement storage space um, that I was, uh, I sort of took a look at it and I thought, you know, what, what is this? What could it be? Um, it's so dirty, so dirty um, that it's hard to even really see uh, what is going on with this painting. Um, and I think, you know, there's a, a lot of, uh, there are a number of Mary Magdalene's <laughs> that are out there and um, the connection um, to Mary Magdalene seems um, pretty strong. Uh, here and so I wanted to sort of start with this painting and see you know what what would happen to it if we you know really did an excellent um, conservation job on it. Um, I'm just going to go through this. There will be this conservation project, so I'm not going to talk about what the conservators did, um, but I'm just giving you a little taste of some of the conservation stuff. Um, I can't see it. So here's a, a half cleaned image um, and here's the here's the painting now um, that's on view at the canter uh, so this was a you know really instructional uh, project for us to do um, because of the fact that uh, it really is a, a painting that with some restoration you really in conservation you get a sense that it's a it's a better painting than <laughs> it looks a lot better than it did um you know before before we cleaned it here's here's the sort of side by side uh, we also learned some interesting things about um overpaint so uh, if you can see my cursor um before there was a book um that was sort of under mary magdalene's um cloak here 
Um, and if you take a look, the book was actually a later edition, um, and it was a, a, it's actually a, a crucifix fix and some a rosary beads that are under there instead. Um, so this is to say, you know, these are works that we already have. Um, so rather than you know really focusing on on you know building collections, I think it's also really important to start looking at what we do have um, and to take care of them um, and see you know really we have a lot of research to do on what we on what we do have here. Here's and another and, uh, Meredith just to mention too that. Um, you know, as you do exhibitions, you can bring in works from the outside to further supplement, complement these works and, and to explore a theme or a thesis like that, but to learn more about your own collection by works that you bring in on loan for a special exhibition. Exactly. So this is, you know, this, for me, this is a, a really great way to think about, you know, maybe some small exhibitions um, that we could do is, you know, could we, could we learn about our, our works of art by bringing things in from the outside? Um, that's an excellent way to, to activate collections. Uh, I know that you know one of the reasons I wanted to do this exhibition is you know, I, there are just a lot of questions on campus about where things are and, and what we have. Um, and uh, I think that it, there's just value in bringing things out and putting them on view for, for people, especially you know faculty to see, oh, I could, you know, I, I didn't know we had this, we could teach with this. Um, and already I, I can feel this, some energy around, you know, people saying, oh, this would really, you know, this might be really interesting, you know, a small exhibition to do or um, a project for a student to do. Um, you know, I've been doing a lot of just sort of talking to people about, <laughs> about what, what it is that we have and, um, you know, really seeing it, um, sort of materializing these objects in space has been an important exercise um, for, you know, future exhibitions, future projects. Um, it would be really interesting to, to build an exhibition maybe around this painting, uh, which, you know, as you can see, had this plaque attached to it of Elizabeth Serrani. Um, Elizabeth Serrani was, you know, Baroque painter from Bologna, um, you know, one of a few female artists that we have, um, that we have a name for. And uh, there's been a lot of uh, recent scholarship on, on Elizabeth Serrani. Um, there was the, the recent exhibition at uh, the Wadsworth Athenaeum and a, a book that's just been published on her oeuvre. Uh, and so, you know, could, could bringing in some pieces around this help us to understand whether or not this is an Elizabeth Serrani? Um, the only thing that we have that attaches it to her is this plaque on the frame. Um, and so, you know, how do we, how do we get at um, whether this is actually her or not? Um, I can tell you, and hopefully you'll come see it. It's a really beautiful painting. It's really, it, it's really fine. Um, beautiful brushwork and, and, and the color is amazing. Um, but I don't, you know, how do we, how do we get to this sort of next level of understanding if this is, I mean, it's really intriguing to think that the Holy Cross might have an Elizabeth Serrani painting, but how do we, how will we ever know if we don't, um, if we don't put it up against examples of Serrani's work to really examine it? Or how will we know? How how would we know if we don't have scholars who know that we have it, um, who can help weigh in on on this? Um, all of that work is really dependent on me right now. You know, emailing various people and saying, <laughs> um, "You, what do you think?" Um, but wouldn't it be nice if we, if we had sort of greater access to collections so that um, you know scholars could could sort of invest in, investigate our collection and try to you know give us information about these about these objects. Great. All right, are there any other questions out there? Can I ask, um, Jim, when you think about conservation, um, sort of as a, a just to, to sort of prime us for our, 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 next, um, our next program about, com about conservation, um, what, how do you think about creating priorities? So it's really, I mean, the, everyone knows, but we'll say it out loud, it's really, a costly endeavor. It costs a lot. Um, of course, Holy Cross does not have a conservator on staff. And so, you know, we have to have somebody from um, outside con contract someone to do this work. Um, and, you know, for me, it's always a balancing of budget. You know, how do I, <laughs> how do I decide how to spend my, th this money? Um, you know, what, 
what do you think about what would you have you know when you were directing the Worcester Art Museum how did you set your your priority your conservation priority list well fortunately Worcester has a long tradition of conservation we were one of the pioneers in America along with Harvard University and so that's always been wonderful but even um, when it's in kind of in-house operation you still have to what you, what are you going to invest your time it's, it's all the time again uh, your conservatives working on but what is really wonderful about conservation is um, whether you go forward with a, con a treatment, how much you can learn thanks to the advancement of science. It's just incredible. Whether it's in analyzing the pigments or the paper it's drawn, drawn on or whatever, um, we can you know, get to maybe the age of the work of art, et cetera. Um, if it's on a wooden panel, we can determine when the tree was actually felled um, and et cetera. It's just incredible. And that's a really, a, a gift from the 20th century, I would say, and conservation became a real science, um, you know, in the big early years of the 20th century. In fact, our first conservator was, uh, and George Stout, who directed the Worcester Museum, was really the pioneer who put on a very scientific basis when he was at Harvard. So, um, you, as I say, when I, I think of conservation, I think of it as another way of examining a work of art, not just doing the final treatment. You may decide, oh, we've examined this with, through our analysis, we've found out it's a copy. Um, the, the canvas is, you know, not 17th century or whatever, and and maybe it's a great copy, and who knows, you might want to, for that reason alone, but it can help you, because it is a big investment. You're absolutely right, Marna. A lot of time goes into it. And conservation, we should explain, too, is um, un, we don't call it restoration, which is the old word for it, because conservation is you're basically doing everything you can to extend the life of this object. In the old days, not knowing uh, sometimes what the pigment they were putting on it or cleaning it was doing more damage actually. You know, maybe bringing in the house painter to touch up the work of art or, um, you know, um, putting on uh, or, or taking off a discolored varnish and removing some of the original paint underneath, et cetera. So um, it, it's an incredible science. We're so lucky to have it and as a strength here in our community here. Um, but it's a big investment of time and you have to make decisions as you go along the way. Mm -hmm. But science can help you with that, on that too. Mm -hmm. So what would you, here's a, here, so here's another that just, we just recently conserved. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just clearing away so I can see it. Um, so this is a, a work that's, you know, one of the big highlights of, of the exhibition is this, this painting. Um, you can see this is sort of the, uh, you can see it sort of in its little slot <laughs> uh, with its frame where we, where we found it. Um, and then we brought it out and um, put it on the wall to see, you know, really what it was. Um, this was, there was sort of a first um, incarnation of this exhibition in the um, fall of 2020, when nobody was on campus, we put a bunch of things on the wall just to see what happened when we took things sort of out of basement with, you know, um, terrible lighting and just put them on the wall to see, well, is, this, is this interesting or not? Some things made the cut, other things did not. Um, this is a painting that when we put it on the wall, we really felt like, okay, this, this is interesting. It also has this gorgeous frame um, that, uh, it has been, we know that the frame has been with, we think the frame's been with it for a long time though. Um, we can talk more about whether the frame's original to the painting. Um, it's signed on the back, which, you know, gives us a little bit of like a clue that, you know, that this is painted by an artist who hadn't, you know, hadn't had a enough of a name to put his name on the back of the painting, Giovanni Lega. Um, so we can then start to think about it in its time, which is mid 19th century. Um, but it had these huge tears, you know, down the front of it. Um, and the canvas was uh, crispy, I guess is the word I would use to describe it. Um, so this was one that we decided, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna see what happens, you know, if we conserve it um, and if it becomes a painting that we can understand better that um, we could put on display, certainly couldn't put it on display with these big rips down the front of it. Um, so this is just a teaser of, you know, here you can see the back. <laughs> Um, Professor Whaley would not ever see this in the Worcester Art Museum collections. <laughs> um, um, here's a here's a close up of the rips that we had that were down the front of it. I mean, just you know, 
dreadful condition. Um, and part of that is, I mean, a lot of that has happened here. I mean, I'm sure almost all of this damage has happened while it's been here on, on the Holy Cross campus. Um, I think those rips probably just happened because the canvas got really dry and it kind of ripped itself apart. Um, I don't think anyone did any physical damage to it, but the, just from being in sort of a non-climate controlled space for a long period of time, um, this is what happens to paintings when they're not just kept in a, in a, in a space that's climate controlled. Um, so here's a cleaning picture. This is just, you know, fun. Here is the painting, the old, the pre-conserved painting. And that's what it looks like now. Um, and you can go see it on the wall um, of the Cantor Gallery. But um, there's some real magic to, uh, to this painting, I think. Um, and the, to, to see it go from, from I don't want to say trash, but <laughs> pretty, pretty close um, to this, to a painting that we can study and look at and um, I think have, you know, have some institutional pride in um, is I think an important you know, piece to this, to the work that we're doing at, at, on the collections. So um, I think that's our time. I want to make sure that nobody has any other any other questions? Um, I do have one comment that I should I should address, which is no, we do not have a conservation budget. Um, we managed to wrangle some money out of our programming budget because we had fewer programs during the pandemic. Um, so our programs budget is really just for special exhibitions, and because we had fewer exhibitions um, last year, we had a little excess um, that we were able to put towards conservation with the assumption that we would be using this conservation um, as a program, right? That this is a part of our program. So we will, we the Cantor has no conservation or collections care money at all. Um, and neither does the college have a, a designated budget um, for that work. So one of the things that we're hoping to do with this exhibition is, you know, some education and resource building around um, the needs of a collection like this. Great. Well, I want to say thank you, Jim. This has been really great. Um, this I should to the audience. Um, Jim has always been a great sounding board for all of this, which is why I in, in, invited him today because he um, will come and look at at paintings with me and help me sometimes to make some of the decisions about um, what might be a good candidate for conservation and what might not be. Um, he's a, a wonderful resource for me and for the college. Um, and I'm so glad that you agreed to do this with me today. Um, everyone else, I'll see you at the Cantor Gallery. We will be um, Holy Cross Collections until February 20th. Um, so we'll hope to see you before, before then. Great, thank you.